Russia having sort of survived, but not quite, this uh, incursion into Kursk is really pretty humiliating. And so uh, one of the things that they have as a differentiator, right, is their nuclear weapons. And so it strikes me that they always lean on this as a crutch whenever they're um, struggling in other areas, like they are now. I think the strategy is evolving in real time. So I think the strategy for a long time, or at least the U.S. narrative, uh, was we're going to be with Ukraine as long as it takes. I think that's pretty difficult to know what that actually means, right? But recently, um, President Biden has changed his rhetoric. He now says uh, we're going to be with Ukraine until they win. Allowing the Ukrainians to be able to strike targets deeper, I think they would sort of feel a sense of boost of morale, right? That the, that the U.S. believes in them, that uh, they're not being abandoned in any way. Welcome everyone, my name is Eugeniusz Romer, I'm from Układ Sił, a foreign policy magazine from Poland. And today I have a great uh, pleasure to interview um, Alisa Dimas from the Brand Corporation. Hello. Hello. And uh, we are going to talk about, um, let's say, the relations between Ukraine and Russia and, and the war which is uh, uh, going on right now. So I think the, the very current issue is whether the Americans should allow Ukrainians to, um, to attack targets deep uh, in Russia using American weapons. So what's your opinion on that or maybe uh, w what consequences would, would such a decision have? Thank you. Um, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, in terms of the question that you just asked, so it's a very complex issue, right? I just got back from Ukraine maybe two weeks ago, and um, the officials that I spoke with and civil society actors, this is the top issue on their minds. Um, understandably so, because the ability to strike targets deep inside Russia, or even sort of in the mid-range, um, really allows them to take some important precautions, allows them to strike targets um, and, and enable certain types of operations that they currently can't undertake. So it's understandable that they would have that position. Um, at the same time, you know, the U.S., I think we all know, is relatively hesitant because of the potential for escalation, right? Um, so um, uh, Putin, as, as we've discussed before, has, has a new uh, nuclear doctrine, yes. new, more sort of bombastic rhetoric in this sense. And I, I think that's probably timed deliberately, right, along with these decisions um, to kind of uh, sway U.S. policymakers to be particularly cautious when it comes to these issues. Um, that said, I mean, U.S. policymakers have been cautious since February 24th, 2022, um, and we have incrementally allowed additional um, whether it's uh, allowing more weapons to be sent to Ukraine or allowing further sort of ranges and distances. And as of now, nothing really has happened. So I think that there is a valid argument to allow um, Ukrainians to use those weapons in sort of further distances. I would also add that the Ukrainians actually attacked Russian territory in Kursk and nothing happened. But do you think that um, in this case, when, when you, uh, Americans uh, allowed uh, Ukrainians to strike targets in Russia. Do you think that Russia is actually bluffing uh, in terms of the using of nuclear weapons, or Vladimir Putin could make that decision? Could uh, could make this decision to to strike Ukraine or any other location with with the nukes? Uh, well, like a lot of uh, policy analysts, I think I I wish I knew what Putin was thinking. I could actually do. I can only sort of uh, hypothesize, right, based on what I understand. Um, in terms of bluffing, I mean, he's sort of waved the nuclear flag a lot in the last two years, and uh, there's been a lot of bluster and very little action. Um, so it's not clear to me, um, with the exception of the fact that Ukraine has actually now invaded Russian territory, what has changed in those two years. So I, th I think, you know, it's hard to say, but the evidence would suggest that perhaps um, nothing will happen. But again, I could stand corrected there. Sure, you cannot say for Vladimir Putin. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I don't dare to speak for him. <laughs> sure, this is totally understandable for me. Uh, so um, coming back to strategic terms, mm. uh, if Americans let Ukrainians attack, um, attack Russia w with uh, the weapons America delivers, um, how would it change the, the strategic situation of Ukrainians? Yeah, I think a couple of things. I think, um, well, one, there's sort of the perceptual change, right? So I think... Um, when I've spoken with Ukrainian soldiers myself, um, when I've spoken with Ukrainian commanders and, and officials, um, there's been a lot of discussion about sort of the, the, um, the impacts of the perceptions of the West and the U.S. in particular standing with and behind the Ukrainians, right? So 
allowing the Ukrainians to be able to strike targets deeper, I think they would they would sort of feel a sense of boost of morale, right? That the, that the U.S. believes in them, that uh, they're not being abandoned in any way. Um, but that's, of course, the perceptual piece. I think there's also an important, of course, tactical operational piece, right, which is that the Ukrainians could then target um, airfields further inside Russia, um, could target um, uh, missile facilities and, and other logistics points. That, of course, all enables uh, Russia to be able to um, prosecute its strikes against Ukraine, both in Ukraine and in Russia. So do you think this uh, would also contribute to like lowering the number of casualties in Ukraine or would it help uh, the Ukrainians survive the upcoming wi winter? Because the, the Russians um, right now they have like um, they can strike from the distance and they can hit Ukrainian, for example, uh, energy plants, right? Yes, absolutely. I think insofar as it would allow Ukrainians to um, uh, prosecute strikes against Russian facilities that are sending those missiles, certainly, uh, and drones, frankly, too. All right. So I would li uh, now like to ask you about the, the American strategy towards uh, mm -hmm. Ukraine again. Uh, so as I assume, the strategy w so far was to deliver defensive, mostly defensive weapons to Ukraine and let's say cripple Russia with sanctions. So do you think this uh, strategy um, has proven to be effective or, or not? Um, well, I think it's a little more nuanced than that, right? So I think the strategy is evolving in real time. So I think the strategy for a long time, or at least the U.S. narrative, uh, was we're going to be with Ukraine as long as it takes. I think that's pretty difficult to know what that actually means, right? But recently, um, President Biden has changed his rhetoric, and I don't know if it's because he's coming to the end of his presidency, so he feels a little more open, or because anything has actually changed measurably, but he now says, uh, we're going to be with Ukraine until they win. Now, that is an important difference, I think. It's not just words. Um, but in terms of the U.S. strategy, um, you know, it strikes me, so I, again, recently came back um, from a couple of trips overseas witnessed uh, the sort of working level Ukrainians and, and American soldiers uh, working uh, hand in hand. And it was really quite impressive to me, sort of the will there between the two countries to really hash out like, not, not anything particularly sexy, but like, you know, sustainment requirements mm. and logistics requirements and all the things that are really ne necessary for this kind of a conflict. But how long do you think this is going to last? Because you may spend let's say one or two winters in a cold room, right? Cold apartment, but how long you can uh, live this way? Well, I mean, Ukrainians have survived two winters at this point, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, they've survived many, many casualties. Um, I think that it's been pretty remarkable how resilient the population has been. They've come up with alternative means of survival. Um, but you, you know, your point is important. Um, I do think um, that ultimately affects sort of the morale of the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian soldiers. But morale is really something that comes and goes. It waxes, it wanes, whereas I think the old underlying will to fight is really there regardless. All right. Um, yeah, so I will come back to Russia again and to its new um, or um, announced uh, nuclear um, doctrine. So what's your opinion on that? Is it um, the only reason the, the discussion uh, in the US whether you should or not uh, allow Ukrainians to strike uh, to targets in Russia, or is it something more? Or maybe is it uh, some kind of si mm, sign of weakness in Russia, because Russia is getting weaker economically and military as well, probably. So um, the only huge argument are actually the nuclear, uh, nuclear bombs. Yeah, I mean, I think your last point is a really important one, which is that um, you know, like you said, the Russian economy is really suffering. They recently came out and said they're going to spend something like 47 percent on, uh, you know, defense mm -hmm. and military issues. I think Russia, um, having sort of survived but not quite this uh, incursion into Kursk is really pretty humiliating. And so uh, one of the things that they have as a differentiator, right, is their nuclear weapons. And so it strikes me that they always lean on this as a crutch whenever they're um, struggling in other areas like they are now. And do you think it might be efficient? Because one may say, for example, if the Russians hit Ukraine with a tactical nuclear, nuclear warhead or hit any country uh, in the eastern flank uh, of NATO. So there is, a, let's say, the sense of uh, the situation that w it resembles the situation we had in at the beginning of the Cold War, right? So, for example, the Russians, uh, the Soviets may, may have may had um, hit um, a target in France, for example, and whether the Americans, that there was the question whether the Americans are going to, to strike back, because mm -hmm. 
American cities can be destroyed. So do you think this is something that actually may, may help Russia succeed? I mean, potentially. So it's a, I think there's a couple of nuances there. I think using tactical nuclear weapons on the battlefield in Ukraine, um, at least I know from the Ukrainian perspective, I think the, the folks that I've talked to, their opinion is, I mean, they've already done their worst, right? They are, are killing our people by the thousands. Uh, they were stealing our children. They've uh, conducted mass genocide. And so like, okay, a tactical nuclear you know, warhead Would on the battlefield. Would it change the, the right. situation that much? I don't think it would necessarily, mm -hmm. but um, I think an errant nuke in, you know, NATO's eastern flank, that I think that would pretty significantly change the calculus, for sure, at least for the West. So is it some kind of, let's say, good strategy for Russia, in your opinion? In what sense? Um, I mean, this is really deterring Americans, let's say, for, mm, from, from helping. Uh, maybe Ukrainians, but also maybe in the future um, deterring uh, Americans from helping eastern flank of NATO. Yeah, so again here, I think, I mean, I do think it's a good strategy in the sense that, you know, flexing your yeah. nuclear muscles always kind of makes people stop and take a step back. Um, but I do unfortunately still think that there is a qualitative difference between NATO countries and uh, Ukraine, right? So I think that were uh, Putin to have a real credible threat um, a nuclear threat towards um, NATO countries, I think the U.S. would certainly step in for sure. Mm -hmm. All right, so coming back to America's uh, strategy towards Ukraine, do you think it may, uh, let's say, significantly change uh, in case of Donald Trump winning the, the, the upcoming elections? I think the challenge there is that um, in the U.S. elections, we haven't really heard like a clear articulation of yeah. the strategy from either side, frankly. Um, I think there's a there's assumptions made by people, hypotheses that um, you know a Harris presidency will you know continue with the similar p policy strategy legacy of the existing administration, um, but she hasn't you know she hasn't affirmed that yet. Mm -hmm. um, I think when it comes to Trump, there's been a lot of sort of bluster. Um, I would say probably really dangerous rhetoric um, with respect to um, Ukraine and certainly NATO. Um, that said. Um, you know, things change all the time when you get into the seat of the office and when you get that first intelligence briefing and you really find out what's going on, it's entirely possible that, that sort of the narrative there could change. Yeah, some, some people, uh, let's say, who are close to Donald Trump, they, they uh, believe that he's, what he's saying about ending the war in three days, um, he means that he's going to deliver uh, really strong weapons to Ukraine, mm -hmm. for, Ukraine for example, and to force Russians to um, to seek peace, or or at least to start um, the talks. But on the other hand, if the Ukrainians didn't want to um, to undertake any any talks with the Russians, they are, he's going to uh, stop um, helping Ukraine. So what he really wants is to uh, establish some kind of um, new border uh, on the front, the current front line, right? So um, do you think? If this scenario was um, is going to be implemented, do you think is it going to be like uh, a long-lasting peace or or some kind of uh, pierdushka, as the Russians call mm. it, uh, just a tactical pause? Yeah. So based on what I understand uh, of you know Ukrainian um, sort of perceptions, Ukrainian attitudes, that seems to be a non-starter for the Ukrainian mm -hmm. public. So yes, the U.S. has an important role, of course, right? Um, in the sense that we are, along with our NATO partners and allies, helping to provide significant security assistance. However, you know, Ukraine is a sovereign country. Like, we can't actually tell them what to do. Um, and so I think it strikes me that it will be um, a wildly unpopular decision to sort of halt the um, front lines and concede considerable territorial concessions to the Russians. Um, and particularly without any kind of, you know, reparations, particularly without um, mm -hmm. any kind of security guarantees, because I think that there is a widely held perception among Ukrainians that um, the, the Russian word, Russians cannot be taken at their word and that any agreement is not worth the paper that it's signed on. And do you think that Ukrainians may agree on um, such terms? For example, the Russians takes, uh, take the, the Donbass but uh, Crimea is some kind of demilitarized um, area, and there is some kind of international peacemaking team that is, um, let's say, protecting the border. Is it possible? 
Um, I mean, certainly it's possible. I don't have like, you know, insights to what uh, Zelensky and his team are mm. actually willing to accept and, and Ukrainian people certainly. Um, but I do know that there is, again, this hesitancy to really accept any kind of terms that Russia puts forward. I mean, look at the Budapest memorandum, right? That <laughs> didn't <laughs> really go so well for Ukraine the first time. Yeah, so I am asking because um, I, I'm just wondering what kind of scenarios are possible in the future. Right. So in your opinion, what kind of scenarios are, mm, are uh, in the game? in terms of ending the war in Ukraine? Because right now we have um, the war of attrition and Ukraine uh, definitely is a smaller uh, country in terms of population, smaller than Russia. So if things uh, continue to be as they are, probably there are the U Ukrainians will just lose. So what's the solution in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, I can at least say that I think from the Ukrainian side, my impression is that there's the hope that they'll be um, better trained, better equipped, you know, take a sort of uh, pause over the winter. Um, regroup, uh, increase their ranks, perhaps get better weapons, um, and be able to kind of conduct uh, more combined arms operations the way that they did in Kursk, which was relatively successful. Um, but I think there's also a recognition that, you know, there will be some kind of, there probably won't be an unconditional surrender. There will have to be some kind of diplomatic solution. Mm -hmm. um, but as for what the specifics of, specifics of that are, I just don't know. Some people say that we have just to outlive Vladimir Putin, <laughs> yeah, so he's the, the, the main source of the problem. Do you agree or would you say that uh, the, the problem is more inherent just in the, in the Russian state? So I think the challenging thing there is um, a, a couple of things. One, um, you know, Vladimir Putin has been there for now well over two decades and um, he's established a system where people like him succeed and power, the kind of power that he happens to like succeeds. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think by virtue of that, um, uh, the people that are waiting in the wings and the people who might have their sort of hands on the levers um, happen to be a lot like him. Um, now, who knows? Like it could be a deck of cards that falls quickly if he if he goes. It, I, I simply don't know, but I would, I would be cautious about just expecting that if he goes, you know, everything will be like sunshine and rainbows. So another Yeltsin scenario is possible. Potentially, sure. All right. And um, in case of uh, the, 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 um, um, the, the Russian victory in Ukraine, do you think that Russia can go further, for example, can invade um, any other country on the eastern flank of NATO, for example? Because some people say, including uh, William Burns, the, the head of the CIA, that in uh, 2027, the Chinese will be, uh, will at least have capabilities to invade Taiwan. So. If they do this, uh, maybe Russia will, I don't know, feel some kind of encouraged to go further. So do you think this is possible? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it, there's a challenge, right? In the sense that, well, it's important because those, those two spheres are connected, being China and Russia or, uh, you know, Russia and its other allies. Um, Russia is pretty wholly dependent, as I understand it, on um, a lot of its sort of more nefarious allies. And I would suspect that if Russia, uh, if China for, any reason decided to invade Taiwan. Yes, of course, the US's focus would probably also be on that. Um, but that's also to say that one of Russia's main partners would also be embroiled in a massive war and probably expect the Russians to help them like they've helped the Russians. So mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's really hard to say. This is a challenging question. And is Russia becoming a junior partner of, of China? I think, I, I think, a, a junior partner is maybe a good characterization. Um, I think that um, certainly not an ally. I think that there's it's a you know a marriage of convenience certainly. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So last the last issue I would like to discuss with you is uh, the Polish-Ukrainian relations. Mm. Um, I think we are very friendly, and uh, the, the Poles believe they help Ukrainians a lot. The Ukrainians are very grateful, but we have also some kind of uh, arguments in this. Uh, new relation. Uh, I think um, the, the, the recent argument between, for example, the foreign minister, minister of Poland, Radosław Cikorski, and uh, Wołdemir Zawański. Uh, so why do you think, um, what causes those, those rifts between Poland and Ukraine? Is it some kind of Russian influence as well? It's entirely possible that it's Russian influence, right? We know that in all the sort of uh, post-Soviet states, the, the Russians always have their um, sort of finger in the pie in terms of um, sort of uh, media channels, uh, social media disinformation, um, all of this. Um, but you know, it also, it stands to reason that two countries would have issues regardless of how close they are, right? It's like, 
you know, two siblings fight, but at the end of the day, they really <laughs> love each other. So, like, there, there's, um, we are, mm, how do you say, we are forced to be together as allies, right? Mm. Some kind of allies, because um, there is no um, Polish security without Ukraine and the other way around. Certainly, absolutely. All right. Um, I said it was the last issue, but I also want to ask you about, uh, I, I forgot, I want to ask you about um, the Russians and their interference. Uh, in the U.S., for example, in the democratic process, in the U.S. elections, do you think that they are really trying to, I don't know, antagonize people, the society, or maybe support one of the candidates? Yeah, I mean, well, if um, uh, the past is any indication, I would say probably. I don't, I don't have any specific evidence there, um, but I mean, we all you have to do is look at the 2016 election, the previous French elections. Yeah. Um, there has been a considerable amount of interference by the Russians. It's difficult though, I mean, it, I say this as a researcher, to know whether or not that actually had any impact, right? Because a lot of it was uh, amplifying existing messages. So it's difficult to say with those kind of variables whether uh, the outcomes would have been any different or the same. And, and that's not me excusing the Russian behavior, but to mm -hmm. say we still don't have good enough evidence to know if their meddling can actually impact the outcomes of elections. And uh, what kind of uh, tools are they using to do this? Uh, all kinds of tools. I mean, anything from um, you know social media posts to um, sort of in-person gatherings. And um, I mean, in, in the U.S., it's less the case, but um, you know, certainly in Central and Eastern Europe, there's you know um, uh, social organizations and uh, in-person meetups and all kinds of uh, like pretty nefarious things. And are they also interfering with, uh, let's say, the, the military structure of the U.S.? Because you wrote an article about it as well, uh, how they, how the, let's say, U.S. Air Forces are, I don't know if, if it's a, this is a correct word, infiltrated by the Russians, but, but if they are trying to, uh, to somehow um, alter the, the opinions of people working there or serving? Well, I certainly think that it, that Russia probably aims to, to affect their opinions. I would not characterize it as infiltrating any kind of U.S. defense establishment, though. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It was a pleasure. So I was talking to Alisa uh, Dimas from Rand Corporations. Many thanks also to our viewers.